great introduction. My goodness. No, I really can sing. <laughs> I was a singer first. I was a musician. So um, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, I thought I'd talk, let's start off not by talking about basic income, but by talking about work. Because I think, you know, basic income, universal basic income, um, in the time that I've been talking about it, which is some years now, um, has become a bit more mainstream. When I first started talking about it, it was the weird fringe. Um, and people going, oh, that'll never work. Nobody will ever be interested in that. Now it's being considered all over the world. Um, but people are seeing it as welfare. And I don't think it's about welfare. I think it's about work. So I'm going to start off by talking about work, which is actually where Paul started, was talking about work. Because we have a crisis of work, actually. We are in what we could describe as, is it a second industrial revolution or maybe a third one? Something like that. And we're seeing the same kind of strains that we saw in our move from an agrarian society to an industrial society. Now we're moving towards a post-industrial society. And we're seeing the same sort of changes in working patterns that we saw then. And we're seeing some of the social consequences already, and this is only set to increase. Um, interestingly, the last time um, something akin to a basic income was first was seriously discussed in the United Kingdom was during that period. And I wrote about this a few years ago. It was the Spinerman system. So I want to talk about what's going on with work and why I ended up saying, actually, we need a basic income. Because the crisis we face, and I think this is driving a lot of the things we're seeing at the moment, like the vote for Trump, for example, in America, is the, the disappearance, really, the gradual erosion and the disappearance of what we might call traditional jobs. Um, the kind of jobs that my parents had, and possibly my grandparents, um, and maybe yours too. Um, you know, the routine jobs in factories on production lines, um, you know, that weren't inspiring jobs in their own right necessarily. It was a lot of armies of people all essentially doing the same thing, but which partly as a result of unionization and you know, the pressure to increase wages to a decent level meant that for a lot of people, it gave them the comfortable lifestyle that they wanted. And it's that comfortable lifestyle that I think is now being eroded by the disappearance of those forms of work the disappearance of routine, traditional, full-time employment in favour of something much more uncertain. Now, I'm a musician, and I started off as a performer, <clears throat> and I then fell into banking because I needed to earn a living. Um, I earned a living, but I found that working in banking, uh, in IT, as a contractor, and occasionally as an employee, um, was not a great deal more secure. Um, and then in 2002, I gave it all up, thinking I wanted to sing, really. Um, so I then spent 10 years or so in an exceedingly insecure job being a singer and a teacher. And then in the financial crisis, as Paul said, I popped up doing some writing, just because I was cross about a lot of things, and found that I got read, and now I do a lot of writing. Um, I've lived in what you might call the gig economy or for 30 years, I think. And I see what's happening now with the rise of self-employment and an increasing number of people living in this very insecure and um, uh, um, in unstable um, lifestyle. And I look at that and say, yeah, we, I, you know, performers have been living like that for hundreds of years, probably. Um, so, in a way, I understand the uncertainty, and I understand what it does to the mind and what it does to the health of people who are who dreamt, dreamt of stability and security of a, maybe a job for life, something, yeah, it didn't inspire them. They went to work to do a job, and then they came home to do whatever it was they wanted to do. You know, people are often very much more productive in their spare time than they are at work. Um, and then finding that the reality is um, living from job to job um, a succession of part-time, temporary, zero-hours jobs, low wages, spells of unemployment, being forced into taking any job just to get them off the unemployment statistics, sanctioned if they don't, um, and increasingly dependent upon benefits because work just does not provide them with the income that they need. Um, the, pr the difficulty of managing an uncertain income and certain outgoings 
How do you pay your rent or your mortgage on a defined date every month when you have no idea when you're going to get paid? Or if you're going to get paid, because your work might have dried up that month. The government at the moment has a push towards enrolling people into pensions. Anybody who works, it works in the uncertain economy, the precariat, as Guy Standing calls it, they don't save for pensions because they can't take the, the risk that comes with having to commit to a pension plan, which means they've got to pay out a certain amount into a pension plan on a certain date every month, and they can't do that. So they don't. This has nothing to do with how much they earn. They might earn quite a lot, but they can't take, but the mismatch between the uncertainty of their jobs and the certainty of their outgoings creates huge, huge stress. And that is where I think our employment is going. Interestingly, there is nothing new about this. In fact, the um, existence of stable jobs with wages was very much a 19th century and sort of first half of 20th century phenomenon that directly arose from the, um, the, the big industrial um, complexes. And as those are eroded and replaced with something much more fluid and transient, we're returning much more to um, the kind of seasonal and piecework type of um, economy that we've seen in the past. Now, we're seeing a lot of re resistance to this at the moment. We're seeing people wanting to bring back traditional jobs. The Luddites of the, 18th, of the 19th century are back with us in force. Let's bring back these kind of, of stable traditional jobs. I don't think those jobs are coming back. Um, we have people who want to have job guarantees. I don't have a problem with job guarantees, but where government tells people what to do. Well, that, that could, be, in, that could um, ease some of the pressures, but should we really be looking for that kind of command economy where people are still told what to do? You will do this job. Um, for me, I think there's another way, and I think we can work with the way in which work is going, which is to do... to towards something much more fluid, much more dynamic, and ultimately, for many people, I think, much more creative. Um, by creating, shall we say, a place of safety, a haven, a rock, an anchor, to which they can anchor their lives, that removes the existential threat of saying, if I don't work, I don't eat, which in many respects is a denial of their basic right to life, which they are asked to compromise, by, in effect, giving up their liberty, their freedom to choose what it is they do with their time. And the price they pay for that, in many cases, is serious unhappiness. What are we doing to ourselves? These are the rights of man, the rights of humans. So I think there's another way. I think that we can create a basic income which will relieve people of that stress. It will give them the basic means to live irrespective of their circumstances. And we can say that they can have that income whether or not they're working and however they choose to work. Because the problem with benefit systems like we have at the moment, where people have unemployment benefits and then it's abruptly withdrawn when they start work, um, is that it creates a conflict between those who are not working, who are seen as getting something for nothing, and those who are working, who are damned hard for working damned hard for not very much more. If we could remove that and say, actually, everybody is entitled to that basic income, and it is theirs by right, and nobody can take it away from them, then we have removed much of the stress that eats away at the mind, that destroys happiness, that wrecks health, and that ultimately creates far more costs for society, because unhappy people are less productive, they're less creative, and ultimately, they are, their health is wrecked, their mental health is wrecked, and we spend huge amounts of money um, in trying to keep them unhappy. So why can't we be more creative? Why can't we give people this kind of anchor which will enable them to choose for themselves what they do, to discover for themselves what they value. Because one of the things about a crisis of work as we have now is it cre creates a crisis of our values. What is it that we really value? In the past, we have valued making stuff. Yeah, real jobs are making stuff. 
In future, and it's already happening, making stuff is something that robots can do better than us. These are the jobs that are disappearing, are the making stuff type jobs. Even some of the kind of caring type jobs are disappearing as well, but they tend to be the more routine ones. The things at which humans excel, we think we're beginning to discover as a non-routine, the one things that require human interaction, the things that require creativity. And all of those, the ability to interact with each other, the ability to empathize, and the ability to create, are our birthright as humans, it's what we do. And I don't just say that as an artist myself, but I believe, strongly believe that actually all humans have the ability to be empathic and creative and to collaborate. So if we could create a basic income which would support people so that they can do things that um, make the best use of their creative ability, their empathic ability, their ability to, to work together, to collaborate, then I believe we could have actually a much more productive and a much happier society. One of the criticisms that's usually leveled at basic income is, well, people will simply stop working. And I think the essence of this is basic. You know, if you set it too high, then probably people will stop working. Um, but if you could actually simply relieve the basic stress, then I think that most people would want to do something productive. And as we face, as we go into this crisis of work, we know that the forms of work in the future, the businesses of the future, the industries of the future will be things that we can't imagine right now. And they will be created by the entrepreneurs among us now, and particularly among our young people now, who will invent things that we can't imagine. If we can support them to invent those new forms of work, produce those new industries, those new businesses, then in the future we can expect them to return to us the support that they've received. I'm rambling a little bit here, but it seems to me that one of the problems with universal basic income, as I said, it tends to be thought of as welfare, and I don't see it like that. I see it as a support for work. Um, one of the changes, it, it, technological changes we have at the moment is the growth of, of online and internet um, type, type businesses, which enable people to work very much more from home, from where they are. And that opens employment, or not employment, but work, um, productive enterprise, let's call it that, because even work has connotations about doing something unpleasant, and I don't think it is. I think work is, it should be fundamentally enjoyable. Um, to people who currently see themselves as not able to work. So it's about empowering people to do creative, productive, and interesting things that benefit all of us, and in the end, return more to us in terms of productivity, prosperity, and happiness than we pay out in terms of supporting those who are trying to work with the new forms of work and develop the new forms of work that we will see in the future. So, universal basic income. Let's abandon our fears that we won't be able to afford it and say, actually, we can't afford not to afford it. Because at the moment, our piecemeal welfare system is expensive, it's divisive, and it is disempowering people. It is forcing people into any job, however unproductive, however um, drudge-like, just in order to live. And it is impeding, or shall we say disincentivizing, companies to automate, to innovate, and to design work in a way that makes the best use both of human beings and of our robot colleagues. <laughs> and I use that term carefully because my last point to you would be that one of the things I think that is dominating everything is this terrible fear of automation and the way in which it's going. And we see ourselves as being superseded by the machines. But actually, we can work with these machines. 
we can collaborate with them to do things that we can't imagine now, working um, alongside them and collaborating with them. In a funny sort of way, even, and if, they, and if it's artificial intelligence, if they're intelligence machines, even more can we collaborate with them. Surely in creating new forms of intelligence, we're just increasing the capability of humans. They are, in a funny sort of way, our children. Do we fear our children? So let's support each other. Let's have the support for, for humans as we move into this new era so that we can have a truly happy and productive collaboration with our robot children in the future. <laughs>